Okay. So good morning. Welcome to this fourth day of the workshop on complex Lagrangian problems of particles in flows. And um, I'm Alessandra Nota. We chair this morning session, and it's a real pleasure to have as a first speaker Andrea Mazzino from Genova. So Andrea, if you're ready. Thank you very much, Alessandra. And Thank you very I much, ask the others to mute the microphone, please. Please, Andrea. Okay, so thank you very much, Alessandra, for the introduction. And thank you very much, of course, to the organizers for the opportunity to participate. And of course, I hope in person in the next uh, ICTS meeting. Um, my presentation today um, deals with fluid structure interaction with the aim of understanding whether or not, and if yes, under which conditions, uh, we can exploit uh, a fiber, you can use a fiber flexible or rigid, depends, it depends on the cases, uh, for measuring flow properties. This is the aim as anticipated in the title. Mm -hmm. uh, I will summarize a number of papers uh, of ours uh, for this aim, and uh, this is why several people must be mentioned and, of course, acknowledged. And uh, let me start from uh, uh, Mattia Cavagliola, uh, who is my, was my uh, PhD student, now postdoc in Genova, and uh, Stefano Olivieri, my former PhD student, now postdoc in uh, Okinawa. Then there is the colleagues and friends uh, Luca Brandt and uh, Aras Banei uh, at the KTH in Stockholm. Then Stefan Brizolara, another uh, former student uh, in Genova, now PhD student at the uh, KTH in uh, Zurich, together with uh, supervised by Marcus uh, Oltzner. So this is the, the teams. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, uh, as I have anticipated, uh, the problem is at hand is essentially a fluid structure interaction problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, there are a myriad of everyday life phenomena caused by interesting phenomena of uh, fluid structure interaction. Some of them can produce really catastrophic events. Uh, and uh, one of the most famous example is probably the structural failure of the famous Tacoma Bridge, like everybody knows, uh, in uh, uh, 1940. Uh, uh, four months, just four months after its uh, construction. And uh, uh, I can show you a, really an old movie, short, very short movie, showing the impressive failure of the structure, which is instructive also for the remaining uh, uh, of the talk. So let us uh, take a couple of minutes for, for this movie, which is short here. Wait a second, got it, okay. Okay. <laughs> Tacoma Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost of over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge. <laughs> Only a 35 mile an hour wind is blowing, but this apparently sets up a rhythmic swinging of the bridge, which increases with each swing. Finally, the swinging road and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. Fortunately, the only casualties were a car stalled on the bridge and a dog. That's really impressive. It's impressive also the fact that uh, several people and a car was on the bridge just uh, five minutes before the failure of the structure. It's really impressive. However, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, what is the cause of this structural failure? Here, the role of turbulence is probably of minor importance. Uh, what is really important here is another mechanism known as uh, flattering. And uh, sometimes it's also called uh, um, vortex-induced vibration. It depends on the structure which is invested by the wind. If you have a, a slender object, you speak about uh, flattering. If you have a, a, a bluff body, you are speaking about, uh, of, uh, um, about uh, uh, vortex-induced vibrations. A bridge, what is a bridge? A bridge, if you consider the deck of the bridge, 
this is a sort of plate, so it's a slender object in a sense, invested by the wind. In this case, we speak about the static. Um, uh, as I said before, you don't need uh, turbulence uh, for flattening to emerge. The instability can be triggered also in a constant stream, as uh, I show in a minute. Hmm? Before to, uh, to, to, to show this, let me say that flattering is a key instability mechanism uh, to avoid also in aeronautics. And here is a, there is another very short, much shorter than the previous one, movie highlighting the importance, uh, the need to avoid this, this instability in aeronautics. Uh, look here. I mean, the reason is the same, of course. There is a wind impacting on a, on a plate, and this plate, as you see, causes uh, important uh, oscillation on the structure, and you want to eliminate this structure. Uh, so let me pass now to uh, analyze this phenomenon in a more schematic way with the aim uh, of understanding how one can predict its occurrence. This is one of, one of the aim. Uh, this way to proceed, as we, as we will see, will be generalized in turbulence for our elastic uh, uh, fiber. So let me simplify the analysis and uh, let me consider uh, a slender, uh, sorry, a bluff body, a cylinder in this case, and uh, assume that there is a flow flowing from the left to the right, impacting the impacting this uh, this cylinder. Hmm? As you know, if the Reynolds number is sufficiently high, what you have is that you have generation of vortices and there is a wake. And because of that, you have generation of fluctuations in the pressure field behind uh, the cylinder. Of course, because you have a different uh, gradient of pressure oscillating in time, you have a force acting on the, on the, on the cylinder, cylinder, which, uh, of course, if it is fixed, it remains so, but it's simply uh, is simply the force is simply acting on this uh, fixed uh, object. But of course, if you now um, fix your uh, your uh, your cylinder to a couple of uh, springs, what you have is that uh, due to the uh, pressure force acting on the cylinder, your cylinder will start to oscillate up and down, up and down in, in a regular motion, in a regular way. Why? This is the origin. This is the, 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 the motion is originated by the vortex induced vibration or flattering in case instead of the instead of this uh, cylinder, you are uh, you, you use, for instance, a plate. OK, um, here there is a realization in a lab. As you see here, there is a cylinder. There is a flow coming from left to right. And uh, as you see, uh, there is a here. There is a, a spring, and as you see, uh, is oscillating. And uh, the frequency of oscillation in water is actually uh, it's, it's, it's not so it's low. It's low because of added mass effects. Uh, hair is much better if you want to have a really sustained oscillations. Indeed, uh, if it is true, as I showed before, that in many situations you want to avoid, of course, this. Uh, uh, sustained uh, uh, oscillations, for the reason that I mentioned for the Tacoma Bridge or in aeronautics, there are actually situations where you want to have this, uh, uh, to generate this, uh, to trigger this uh, uh, instabilities. That, for instance, when you want to harvest energy from the ambient. And the, the example I showed here is just an, is the simplest, probably, example to um, harvest energy from the ambient. In which way uh, you have to trigger oscillation up and down due to the a vortex shading I showed before. Then uh, imagine to have a magnet and to fix the magnet here on the, uh, there is no mouse, why? Wait a second, sorry. I lost the mouse. I don't know why, but I mean, there is no mouse. Okay, the same. Uh, imagine to have a magnet, you attach the magnet, magnet to the, on, the, on, the, on the cylinder. And then if you have a coil, you simply have to, um, to, 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 Arrange the system in a way that the, the magnet is uh, passing through the, the coil to generate in a way that uh, you are generating this way uh, uh, electricity via the Faraday effect. What you want in this case, of course, is uh, you want to have high frequency and high amplitude. And the reason is simple because if you remember the, the, the Faraday law, you need to have a large value of the phi over dt, where phi is the magnetic flux. Because d over dt is simply, if you, if you retransform the signal, is simply omega, the frequency of the motion, of course, you need the high frequency. Hmm? 
how to generate high frequency in situation where you want to have um, the, the, the flutter instability to generate this motion. You simply, a good idea is to, uh, to, to consider a system in air, simply because you don't have the added mass, which is relevant in water. And in this case, so the, the effective mass is reduced. Uh, and this means that the frequency will be higher. Um, another idea is to replace the cylinder with a, a, uh, with a wing. Uh, it is well known that the airplane <laughs> receives uh, the lift uh, thanks to the uh, particular uh, form of the, uh, of the, the wing. Don't, uh, they do not have a uh, cylinder in, instead of wings for <laughs> obvious reasons. And uh, if you do that, you have a, a system. If you can consider a system like that. Let me animate this. Okay. Oh, what is this? This is uh, um, uh, the system is composed by four uh, elastomers. You can see them going up and down. Then there is an axis where the four elastomers are connected, and then, as you see, there is a there is a wing uh, going up and down, up and down. Uh, the scale to give you an idea of the of the system is of the order of uh, ten uh, centimeters, uh, more or less, in all directions. And the incoming wind from left, from right to left, is of the order of uh, four, three meters a second. To give you an idea of the frequency of oscillations, here is of the order of 15 hertz compared to the frequency of the order of one second that I showed in previous movie in water. So here it's much more efficient to, uh, to, to, to generate electricity once you, of course, use a coil and a magnet, as I showed schematically. Uh, before. Hmm? Uh, why this system is oscillating? You don't need power. You don't need power to, uh, to, to, to maintain or to trigger the oscillations. The system is able to, to the nature is uh, in a sense uh, uh, triggering the, uh, the motion via the fluttering instability. And uh, what is important to note here is that, uh, uh, as you see, uh, the, 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 there is a the, the vein, let me say the vein, uh, or which is a wing, uh, which is going up and down, and the, the frequency of this motion is the same as the frequency with which uh, the, elastom the elastomers are stretching and uh, are st stretched and compressed. Right? So there are two frequencies, at least two frequencies in the systems, one related to the motion of the vein, of the wing, <clears throat> and the other related to the motion of the elastomers. Okay, this is a key point also for, in, for uh, the analysis in the following. Oh, uh, let me try, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> let me try to simplify a little bit uh, the analysis and uh, let me uh, consider um, the system, let me simplify the system in the way depicted in the picture above. Uh, you have a wing, which here we have a dimension for the sake of simplicity. We have a wing, we have uh, the elastic degree of freedom, the freedom here represented by a simple uh, spring. It is really a simple exercise uh, um, to write down the, the Newton equation for uh, the system. What is not so easy, I mean, it's a uh, material present in a textbook of aerodynamics, is to write down, to write down the, the loads due to the fluid on the, uh, on the wing. Uh, there is a theory, uh, essentially a potential theory, um, due to, um, there, may, there are many authors, so I don't want to spend time on that, but what is important to say is that uh, the loading are known analytically in the limit of small oscillation. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, uh, you can identify the system coupled, of course, uh, in the sense that the degrees of freedom, freedom related to the elastic spring is, is uh, coupled to the elastic, the, the degrees of freedom related to theta. That means the up and down motion of the, of the wing. Let me simplify really uh, the, the system in a way to highlight the, uh, the, the key points. The key points is that here we have, uh, you can identify two equations for the theta degrees of freedom and uh, the elastic, uh, the elastic uh, spring. The first equation I showed here, uh, the wind vane, what I call the wind vane, uh, is, as you see, is a, an elastic oscillator with a frequency where the wind, uh, which depends on, on the wind intensity, capital U. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a restoring force, as uh, physically speaking, it's very, very clear the origin of this uh, term. Imagine that uh, you have uh, the wind coming from left uh, to right, and uh, your wind, uh, the nose of the wing is up. 
of course, the wind is incoming and pushes the, the wind down and it moves down. But once it is down, the wind again forces uh, the nose to go up and so on. This is a restoring force and the resulting equation is the disharmonic oscillation oscillator with the frequency given by the expression on, on the right. Mm -hmm. So wind is entering, entering sorry, in this, uh, in this frequency, which uh, is called the wind vane uh, frequency. On the other end, there is the elasticity of the structure, which here is uh, really very simple. It's just a spring, so who can spring? So this means that the elastic oscillation, the frequency of the elastic oscillation is square root of k divided by n. So the idea is now to balance these two frequencies. And uh, we assert that if you balance this frequency, we, identi we are identifying in this way the condition for flapping to occur. If you do the balance, uh, you arrive immediately at the relationship written on the, on the, on the right. The critical value of V for flapping to emerge is proportional to k to the one half uh, times rho to the power minus one half. Uh, rho is the density of the wing and k is the spin constant. Of course, the simple way to proceed uh, does not capture prefactor. So we can have some prefactor, hopefully, of order one in front of uh, uh, this relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, does it work? Uh, we performed uh, numerical simulations to verify whether or not uh, it works. And uh, these uh, are uh, the results. Um, in the first pitch on the left, uh, along the ordinate, we have uh, the velocity, u, and along the ashisa, we have uh, rho, the density of the wind, while uh, on the other pitch, or k uh, on the ashisa, and uh, u along the, the ordinate. What we did are a series of numerical simulations, starting from a uh, rest position, that means uh, the uh, wing aligned with the flow field. Then we added a small perturbation to the wing, and see what happens. This is what we did. Hmm? Uh, the dashed line are the two lines corresponding to the uh, critical, uh, to the, 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 the phenomenological prediction I mentioned before, while uh, the, 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 the circles, empty and uh, uh, filled circles, correspond to the results of the simulation, and filled means instability, and empty circles means uh, uh, stable conditions. Forget PM stable and PM unstable, I forgot to uh, to erase because it is another model, which is the phenomenological model, by the way, the Pesavento model, which uh, I don't want to discuss here because it's an essential for the purposes uh, uh, of this talk. Uh, as you see, uh, there is a good agreement in the sense that uh, in, it is compatible, what we observe numerically is compatible with the, uh, with the simple uh, phenomenological prediction. This is true for the, uh, for the um, left picture, but it's also true for the right picture where now we plotted the behavior uh, versus k, and the, the dashed line is corresponds to the expected k to the power one half. Once again, we have the right correspondence between uh, phenomenological theory and simulations. So uh, the message is that the simple way to proceed to identify uh, the occurrence of instability, in this case, uh, flutter instability, can be obtained easily by balancing to uh, the two relevant uh, frequencies uh, appearing in the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. So this is the first uh, uh, message. Uh, just for, for the sake of curiosity, this is uh, not essential for, uh, for, for the present talk. Uh, this idea has been uh, works also to, uh, to, to, to start energy. As I mentioned, uh, in the field of energy harvesting, you want to um, optimize, you want to trigger this kind of instability to uh, extract energy from, uh, from the ambient. This is a small divide. There is a, a patent from uh, my university, which can extract energy. Of course, the, 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 the size, the, the amount of energy you can extract for a device like that is uh, really very small. I mean, uh, we are speaking of a milliwatt for a device, the size of which is uh, 10 centimeter. And uh, the wind uh, is of the order of a meter per second. Okay, it's, so it's a really nothing with respect to what you can gather in terms of a, a classical turbine where we can, uh, we can uh, obtain, uh, how to say, uh, 20 megawatts, something like that for a usual, uh, a normal uh, wind turbine. But nevertheless, uh, this is important for a myriad of applications in the environment because sometimes you need milliwatt 
imagine that you want to give power to some sensors and uh, you use many, many sensors distributed in the environment uh, to detect uh, landslides uh, or other kind of uh, uh, environmental phenomena. This is a way which is, uh, it works, I mean, and you need milliwatt in that case. Hmm? Okay, uh, let us proceed with the main uh, uh, aim of, the talk, of, of this talk. Um, so I'm ready now to, uh, to move uh, to, the, to the main aim of the talk. That means uh, we want to understand whether or not, given a fiber, which is uh, another example of uh, elastic uh, structure, object, we want to know whether or not, in terms of this fiber, fiber we can measure uh, flow properties, uh, in this case, uh, both in turbulence, actually, and also in uh, simpler uh, chaotic, uh, chaotic flow. What is the idea? Let me anticipate the idea. The idea is that uh, you can imagine to measure the velocity in one end of the, of the fiber, the velocity of the fiber in one end, and then do the same on the other end. Then you can take the difference and you can project this velocity difference along the axis of the fiber, the end and distance the direction, or if you want, in a given normal direction. You are constructing in this way the well known in turbulence. Um, um, uh, transverse and uh, uh, longitudinal velocity fluctuation. What you want to understand is whether or not the velocity fluctuations defined on the fibers are related to the velocity fluctuation of the flow field. This is the main question we want to, uh, to, 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 to answer. So, how to answer this question? Of course, we need a model for the fiber. In, in all our works, we use the simplest model of the fibers described in terms of the so-called Euler-Bernoulli equation. This kind of fiber, this kind of model, sorry, was already introduced by Jeremy in his talk, in this time, beautiful talk. Uh, probably Jeremy uh, called this equation the Coursera equation, it's the same. I mean, it's probably, in the, the name is probably community dependent. It's the same equation. It's uh, essentially the, uh, the Newton, the second Newton law, law expressed for this, uh, for this uh, uh, object, uh, which is uh, very, very slender. Mm -hmm. So let me recall uh, very, very rapidly the, the meaning, uh, the physical meaning of all terms involved in this uh, equation. Uh, the first one is, uh, of course, inertia, Ma. The, the rho, is, rho 1 is the linear density of the fiber. And uh, let me move to the, to the first term on the right-hand side, uh, where there is T, capital T is the tension. Tension, of course, is not constant along the fiber. S, by the way, I forgot to say that S is the curvilinear abscissa, and T depends, of course, on S. And the dependence, I mean, is not trivial. In the sense that uh, uh, when I told you that this is a simple model uh, for, the, for the fiber, this doesn't mean that uh, this model is trivial. Actually, it's not trivial, and one source of non-triviality is due to the tension. Why? For the same reason for which uh, the Navier-Stokes is uh, a complex problem due to the no locality, which in the Navier-Stokes equation is due to pressure. Here, the tension is causing the no locality of what happens on the fiber. Why? Because you have to impose the in, in the inextensibility constraint via the relationship written on the bottom of the slide. And if you do that, you arrive uh, immediately um, at a Poisson equation for T that you can imagine to solve at least, uh, uh, in, at least schematically, uh, formally, sorry. And you can imagine to, to uh, replace the solution within this fiber. And what you have is a model which is no local. Uh, by the way, I was really excited at the beginning when I started to work uh, on fibers because I was imagined to, uh, I, was, I had the idea to use the, the Kraken ensemble and to try to understand analytically how Gaussian fluctuation, the velocity field, transfers uh, to the fibers. Actually, I realized soon that it is actually very difficult, probably impossible, I don't know, due to this non-locality. So T mm, is a source of problem if you want to do analytical, to treat analytically this object. Uh, let me move to the simpler uh, terms involving gamma. Uh, this is the bending rigidity. <clears throat> so the only source of elasticity in this, uh, uh, in this uh, model is due to the bending. So if you imagine to bend the, uh, the, 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 um, the fiber, it offers some resistance, and this resistance is given by this term. There is another term, which is uh, actually also, uh, in principle, is uh, another source of the non-triviality, and it's the loading. The loading due to the fluid flow. 
Um, in the following, we consider a fully coupled uh, fiber uh, in the sense that uh, the fiber will be deformed by the, the flow field. Uh, due to the fluctuation of the field, of course, we'll be able to stretch or compress uh, to the form in general the fiber, the fiber. And of course, the fiber will affect also the, uh, the, the, the flow field locally, at least locally. Of course, if you have many fibers, the effect can be as a whole. But if you have just one fiber, uh, the, 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 the effect will be uh, restricted to the um, uh, to close to the fiber. Hmm? So this is the model. Uh, and let me assume for a moment, I mean, just for this analysis, uh, let me assume that uh, the fiber is uh, passive, just for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Then we will move to the, to the fully coupled case. And uh, in this case, I used uh, a, simple, uh, a simple viscous uh, coupling between fluid and uh, fiber, the second term on the left-hand side. And notice that I'm simplifying uh, further this term because I'm assuming a, a sort of isotropic situation. Uh, Jeremy discussed the case where he had a, um, an isotropic uh, drag. This is a drag, of course. You have uh, here we have an isotropic drag. That means that, that I'm assuming that uh, the drag, if you move the fiber along the axis or along a direction normal to the axis, is more or less the same. Now, this, for the sake of simplicity, and you see, for the it is, this is not inessential for what I'm going to to say. Hmm? I repeat, when we consider numerical simulation, uh, the fiber will be fully coupled. No assumption on the on the kind of uh, drag between uh, fluid and fiber. So let me balance now uh, the first ter term on the left hand side and the inertial term and the bending term. If you do this balance, immediately you, you identify by simple power counting the typical, the elastic time of the structure. So what is nice in this system is that we have just one time. We don't have a hierarchy of times of elastic time, just one, which is easy, which is good for uh, to understand what, what's happening in the system when he is interacting with uh, with uh, with, turbul with turbulence, where we have an hierarchy of uh, uh, time scales. So this is the last time, and uh, well, notice that there is this alpha, but this alpha, uh, of course, does not appear uh, by this simple uh, um, mean field uh, balance uh, argument. Alpha is the result of uh, uh, formal normal mode analysis. Oh, okay, so. I don't want to want to give you details on that. Uh, let me now move to balance the inertia with the uh, friction. If you do this balance, uh, immediately we identify the viscous damping. What is this, this? The viscous damping. Imagine to bend the fiber. If viscosity is very important, what you what you have is that uh, almost immediately. Uh, I mean immediately, uh, the, the fiber relaxes to the final position. Eventually, without oscillation, if the viscosity is sufficiently large. If viscosity is sufficiently small, you have the contrary. You bend the fiber and it starts to oscillate. Probably you need many oscillations before the fiber uh, returns to the final straight, straight position. Mm -hmm. At more formal level, what you have to do now is to take the ratio between tau b, the elastic time, and tau eta. And you have the, uh, in this way, we can understand, we can, uh, we can separate the so called underdumped case when zeta is much smaller than one and the overdumped case when zeta is much larger than one. If you want, you can rephrase these two regimes in, term of, in terms of C, the length of the, of the fiber. If C is sufficiently small, you end up, we, we enter, we, we are in the underdumped case. On the contrary, when C is sufficiently larger, you are in the overdumped case. Hmm? Oh, so. Let me assume to be uh, in the underdumped case, which is probably the richest one because you have inertia, we have the possibility to have an internal uh, oscillation with the natural frequency, but we have also dissipation sooner soon or later. So it seems to be the, the most interesting uh, situation. Uh, and in this case, you have two, as I discussed before, we have two times. We have just one times for the fiber, the elastic time, but you have a hierarchy of times uh, in relation to the turbulent fluctuations. Now we want to proceed exactly as I did for as, as, as I did for the uh, flattering instability. Mm -hmm. That means I want to um, balance the elastic time with the typical time of turbulence at the scale evaluated at the scale of the fiber, which is tau tau c, 
And tau c is simply the eddy turnover time of turbulence at the scale of the fiber. So the idea is to impose this balance and to associate this balance at the as a flapping condition uh, on the fiber. Exactly, if you, if you remember what the, we discussed for the uh, slap ring instability, this, this is exactly the same argument. Mm? And uh, because there are many uh, friends and colleagues uh, uh, with a huge experience in polymer physics, uh, this is something that we, 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 we do in polymer physics uh, to identify the, the Lamy scale. That's precisely the same. Tau B is the, is the, is the zim time. Tau C is the editor number time of turbulence evaluated, of course, not at the scale of the polymer, which is a really very small with respect to the scales, the inertial range of scales, uh, but it is evaluated uh, at, uh, on a scale that you want to determine. And indeed, this balance in that case give you, gives you the Lumley scale, which is a microscopic scale, often entering the inertial range of scales. Okay. What is the difference? The difference between our case, the polymers are very, very small, and the Lumley scales appears as an, an effect of the network of polymers. So there are similarities, but this is also a huge difference with respect to what we are doing here, where tau c, I repeat once again, is referred to, refers to the, uh, to the scale of the fiber. That means it length scale c. OK, so if you do this balance, the balance is written uh, uh, here, alpha. Sorry, I don't have the pointer, so I cannot uh, indicate with the pointer where I'm speaking. Uh, so alpha times uh, the square root of something that has to be of the same order magnitude of tau c, and the final results, you can solve as a final result um, this algebraic relationship, and you arrive at uh, gamma crit, the critical value of gamma for the flapping to occur. This is the meaning of this, uh, uh, of this condition. So how to verify this condition, how to uh, understand the meaning of this critical value of gamma identified in this way? It should be associated to a resonance, but of course we have to verify that in terms of numerical simulations. And this is the first numerical simulation we did several uh, years ago, is the, the beginning of this activity actually. And uh, uh, the late motif of this talk will be homogeneous uh, uh, isotropic uh, turbulence inside which we plug fibers fully coupled, not passive, fully coupled to the fiber, both in the case where we have just one fiber and also in situation where we consider many fibers interacting hydrodynamically between them. Mm -hmm. Let me start from the simplest situation where we have just one fiber. The fiber, the length of the fiber will be uh, sufficiently long in a way to be within the inertial range of scales of turbulence. What about the ruling equation? We have the classical Navier Stokes equation that you can see it, uh, here. And uh, there is this equation are fully coupled to the equation for the fiber I showed before. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side of the Navier Stokes equation, we have two kinds of forces. The first one, Ft on the, on the right, is the usual force you need to force fluctuations uh, in the flow field. So the, the classical large scale forcing to force uh, fluctuation and then the energy flux within the inertial range of scales. Small f uh, in the Navier-Stokes equation is, uh, um, is the same essentially uh, uh, of the, as the force acting on the fiber, capital F. It's the same in the sense that uh, action reaction, fear Newton, fear Newton law. That means that uh, one is the opposite of the other, but actually one is defined on uh, in the Eulerian grid, numerically speaking, a small f, while the other is defined on the uh, Lagrangian grid for in relation to the uh, description of the fiber. So there is a the Peskin transform in a way to pa to pass from. Uh, uh, the Eulerian grid to the uh, Lagrangian grid. But essentially, one is the opposite of the other due to the, I repeat, the theory of Newton law. Oh, uh, the fiber is fully coupled to the Navier Stokes equation via uh, a well verified and standard uh, immersion boundary method. Hmm? And here are some results. Uh, here we fixed. <coughs> uh, we, uh, how, how we did, uh, uh, how we obtained these results. Imagine that you have your fiber inside the, the flow field and imagine to follow the fiber for a long time. And uh, while tracking the fiber, you can measure 
the velocity on both ends of the fiber. In this way, you can, of course, uh, also if you want, you can calculate uh, um, the transverse uh, velocity difference or the uh, longitudinal velocity difference. And uh, in terms of this quantity, uh, you can easily compute the elastic energy stored in uh, your system, in your fiber. And you can see in which way this elastic energy behaves as a function of gamma. And this is the result plotted in this, uh, it is reported in this graph where gamma is, uh, has been normalized by the critical value of gamma uh, obtained in the simpler, in the simple uh, phenomenological way I mentioned, I described before. As you see, there is a resonance in the sense that the elastic energy uh, has a peak for gamma of the order of the critical value of gamma. And uh, also you can also see that uh, by varying the, 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 the the length of the fiber, C over L, uh, look at the, uh, the value of uh, C over L in the picture, um, the larger fibers are associated to higher value of the elastic energy. And this is simple to explain because longer fiber are subject to, are subject to higher fluctuations because simply because the K41 energy spectrum, which is decreasing from large to small scales, okay? Uh, so, there is uh, a peak corresponding to the critical value of gamma identified, so it seems to be okay in the sense that the balance indeed is associated to, uh, to a resonance in the sense that you have a peak in the elastic energy. And now we want to understand better the meaning uh, of, gamma, of the critical value of gamma we have identified. And to do that, we have uh, measured during, uh, while tracking the, the position of uh, of the fiber, it is also possible and it is easy to measure the flapping frequency of the fiber, in which way we have simply to, to take the end-to-end -end distance and to analyze by Fourier transforming the end-to-end -end distance, which is, of course, varying in time. You take the peak in the energy spectrum and you see, you define in this way, corresponding to the peak, you have the frequency we, we, we define as the principal um, flapping frequency of the fiber. If you plot this frequency as a function of gamma, and you normalize the frequency in terms of uh, the, 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 the turbulent frequency, which is simply one divided by the added turn over time of the turbulence evaluated at the scale of the fiber. If you plot this quantity in terms of the gamma divided uh, gamma critical, you obtain uh, this curve which is uh, quite interesting because uh, this curve is showing two completely different regimes. The first one is below, is occurring below the critical value for gamma below the critical value we have identified. And there you can see that there is a plateau and the plateau corresponds to say, is, uh, corresponds to say that the fiber flapping frequency is uh, almost the same, is the same uh, as the frequency of turbulence. Uh, this means that the fiber is slaved to uh, turbulence. And in a sense, uh, we are answering half of the questions we asked at the, be at the beginning of the talk, in the sense that uh, from the point of view of temporal property, of two-point temporal property of turbulence, uh, a fiber, provided that uh, the gamma of this fiber is smaller than the critical value we have identified, is able to measure property of the flow. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a proxy as far as temporal properties uh, of turbulence are concerned. But the situation is totally different if you move uh, on the right of gamma. When gamma is larger than the critical value of gamma, as you see, there is a, a linear behavior. Uh, we are a log log plot, so it's a power, but I mean, it's power is respondent uh, um, uh, one half. Uh, so this is the square root of uh, the square root uh, of the gamma over critical value of gamma. And this corresponds to the um, natural frequency of oscillation of your fiber. So roughly speaking, uh, the critical value of gamma uh, is in a sense separating uh, two different regimes. One can be defined uh, a soft regime of your fiber, while the other is a sort of rigid regime where the fiber is oscillating not at the frequency of turbulence, but is, oscillation, is, is oscillating to, its, uh, to the natural, to its natural, with its natural uh, frequency. So totally different regimes. Oh, now, uh, so as I said before, I'm answered in this way to half of the, uh, the questions I, 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 I formulated the, at the very beginning of the talk. 
Uh, let me try to answer also to the second part of the question in the sense that uh, imagine now to, to, to be here in the, in the um, for gamma, for instance, is about one half the critical value of gamma. That means within the plateau. And here we ask whether or not we can use that for the, the fiber as a proxy also in relation to the spatial properties of the, the turbulent field. And uh, how to answer this question, you can measure easily uh, the, the structure function of the fiber just by uh, tracking the fiber, measuring the velocity difference across the fiber, and then project them along the longitudinal uh, direction. That means uh, along the end uh, to end distance. Mm -hmm. If you do that, of course, you need a long track because you have to average uh, in time. But if you do that, uh, you can measure, of course, uh, this. If you want the second order touch function, you have to take uh, the difference that will be to take the moment two and then take the average over time, or if you want, the third order structure function. Second order structure function is, uh, is easy to have a good convergence for the second order structure function. It is more difficult for the third order structure function because there is no modulus. This is the actual uh, third order structure function. That means that you have cancellation, as you notice, more, uh, you need a huge statistics to have a, a nice behavior. Uh, the circles, uh, the uh, field and circles, are the results for uh, the numerical simulation, the Eulerian, the classical uh, uh, DNS based uh, um, results. Uh, and you can see the statistics that there is huge and we have nice uh, scaling lows. In red, we have just uh, you use the three fibers of different length, and this is, these are the results obtained for the fiber. As you see, the error bars are very, very small. For the second order structure function, you have some larger error bars for the reason I mentioned, but nevertheless, there is compatibility with what we, uh, we obtained in terms of the standard um, Eulerian measurements. Mm -hmm. So also the second, uh, the second part uh, of the answer, the question will answer in the sense that uh, there is evidence that you can measure four properties of the fiber, provided that the fiber is within the uh, soft regime we have already discussed and identified. Of course, we can complete the, the, the picture by looking at the whole probability density function of the velocity fluctuations. Here we are confined again on the longitudinal uh, velocity fluctuations. The open circles are the, the standard measurements in terms of the uh, uh, measurements. While the, close, uh, the, the field circles uh, refers to the measurements done in terms of our Lagrangian tracking. As you see, there are the, 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 the Lagrangian uh, uh, tracking uh, measurements are noisy for the reason I already mentioned. I mean, the statistics you have is a, uh, is a very, very smaller with respect to what you have in terms of uh, uh, the Euler measurements. We have a cube to be compared with just uh, a long track. Hmm. Okay, so uh, small conclusion: the answer is that if you have a fiber, provided that you have you are within the uh, soft regime, it seems that you can measure uh, four properties in terms of this uh, fiber. Let me move to another situation, uh, which is essentially the same uh, as far as the turbulence is concerned, but now you have uh, many fibers. And uh, uh, we consider in these uh, three pictures uh, uh, 1,000 fibers, different length, as you can see above. L is the, uh, the, the classical uh, uh, um, integral scale. Um, and uh, as you see here, uh, there are, there are, this is a cut, the simulation are three-dimensional. Here, of course, uh, we are in a situation which is not dilute. But it is, it is not really, uh, then we are not in a dense uh, regime. So there is a, an, eff an effect, a clear effect of a back reaction uh, changing the properties of turbine as a whole, as we will see in a moment. Uh, so the situation is different with respect to the previous uh, situation where, with just one fiber, as I, as I discussed, we are not uh, changing the property uh, of turbulence as a whole here. Situation is different from this point of view. Uh, I don't want, I don't, I would like, but I don't have time to discuss uh, clustering, uh, alignment, and so on. I can say that there is clustering, that there are alignment, there is alignment uh, with, with different uh, um, turbulent uh, observables. And uh, I hope to discuss this part uh, in the next ICTS meeting. 
in person, I hope. Uh, so let me proceed with the aim, uh, the main aim of, the, of this presentation. Now we want to answer the same question I already discussed before. So no weather can use fiber also in this case as a proxy of uh, terminals. Here the situation is different because, uh, as I as I uh, as I said, uh, um, there is a feedback. And uh, let me start the analysis from the uh, from the fiber we consider of small inertia. So around one thousand fiber, the inertia which is very small. In that case, as you see from the spectra uh, reported on the right, the first one on the top, uh, as you see here on large scales, you don't see essentially relevant effects due to the feedback of the fiber to the flow. N equal to zero is the black uh, line, which is obscured by the green one. So imagine that the black line, that means that the situation in the absence of fiber is coinciding with the, with the green line uh, in the picture. So essentially, at large scale, you don't have any uh, relevant effect. While there is some effect on small scales, as you see, uh, small scales, uh, uh, increases uh, due to the presence of these uh, small uh, uh, fibers. Why you have this effect? Uh, this effect has been discussed in a nice paper by Jeremy and Stefano and co-workers. Uh, as far as I remember, the title is uh, Dusty Turbulence. It is probably in the web. And uh, the reason uh, uh, is the same invoked by Jeremy and Stefano, in the sense that uh, what is the role of fiber? The role, the simplest role of fiber uh, in the flow, when they are plugged in the flow. Essentially, they increase the, uh, the, 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 the density of the flow locally. Where they are, there is the flow plus uh, an object uh, a little bit uh, heavier than, uh, than the flow field. So the density is increased due to this fact. And because of that, the Reynolds number is uh, larger. So this, this can be an explanation for the fact that you have a tendency to increase uh, uh, in relation to the energy at small scales. Uh, in relation to the energy flux within the ratio range of scales, if you look at the flux is uh, reported in the inset, you don't see really uh, major variations. Uh, if you look uh, uh, on the bottom of the inset, you see a small, uh, the small curved reported uh, dash dotted points. I mean, it's really almost negligible. So in that case, despite the fact you have uh, 1,000 of fiber, the effect at the level of cascade is uh, almost negligible. Hmm? Let me move to the larger, the, the situation of fiber with larger inertia. In that case, uh, the effect is uh, present also at large scales. And of course, uh, and, uh, it, is, it continues to be present also at small scales uh, with a similar effect we discussed for the situation of the uh, fiber with smaller inertia. Uh, what is the physical explanation uh, for the effect uh, occurring at large scales? Uh, the physical explanation uh, seems to be really simple in the sense that imagine to consider this is a sort of asymptotic situation where the fibers are really uh, heavy, really heavy. In that case, you can imagine that the, the, the weight is so high that they remain essentially fixed to, the, to, to a given position hmm? because of the mass is really high. Um, in that case, you are building in this way a sort of porous medium. And in this porous medium, of course, there is a loss of energy as in relation to the large scales, simply because there is friction. You have a network which is fixed if the inertia is very high. And this means that the energy necessarily is uh, depleted also at large scales. And indeed, uh, more quanti I don't have time to, 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 to give details on that, but uh, the analysis we did at quantitative level show that as far as the large scales are concerned, you have a mechanism of the extraction of energy at the, from the large scale, which is a mechanism a la Darcy. So the Darcy um, term uh, to be headed on the right hand side of the Nevestor's equation is enough to understand what, what's happening at large scales. Oh, uh, what about the smaller, uh, the, the smaller uh, scales? So what you have, uh, probably you have uh, at least a couple of uh, mechanisms. The first one is the one I already mentioned, valid for uh, small inertial fibers. Here we have one more mechanism, which is probably trivial, <laughs> which is due to the fact that once you have this network, you have the circulation inside the network, which was absent, of course, in the absence of network. So we are creating a circulation simply induced by the fact that now we have a region where the fiber can move uh, due to the presence of this uh, 
rigid network. I'm saying rigid network because I'm thinking to the limit of very, very large inertia where the fiber essentially are fixed in space. Okay. At the situation, you can imagine that same situation holds also when the fiber have an inertia not so high as in this asymptotic limit. So this is just to give an idea of the possible explanation of uh, the origin of what we are observing. Hmm? So we can move to uh, the final, uh, the final uh, picture on this topic. Uh, and we want to understand uh, whether or not we have a similar curve um, we observe for the single isolated uh, fibers. And uh, uh, we have to plot in this case, as we did before, the flapping frequency of the fiber normalized by the turbulence uh, frequency as a function of the natural frequency of the fiber divided by the frequency of turbulence. Remember that this quantity on the ascissa can be recast in a way that it is uh, for the Kolmogorov, for the K41 case, this quantity on the ascissa is equivalent to say gamma divided the critical value of gamma to the one half. Hmm? But this is doable only on the, in case we have a K41 uh, prediction. In this case, uh, as I see, as I, I just showed before, uh, there is no Kolmogorov scaling, especially for the, especially for the um, inertial fibers. So the, the, the argument I showed you before for the single fiber in turbulence doesn't apply here. So the, 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 the turbulence frequency uh, can be reduced, uh, as I showed on the top part of the slide on the, on the right, on the left, simply the square root of the second order structure function divided by C. We tried both the uh, two times two, two ways to measure S2, both in Lagrangian terms and the Eulerian terms, the results we're going to show essentially are the same. Mm -hmm. If you do that, what you have essentially is that you have a nice data collapse. Um, we tried the many, many different comb combinations, different number of fibers, different uh, length of fiber, different stiffness uh, and different inertia. And we put all together and here symbols, uh, different symbols, symbols means uh, different uh, uh, properties of the fiber according to what uh, I mentioned. And uh, you see that there is a, a flat region and uh, these two and uh, an inclined slope is exactly as before. This corresponds to the underdamped region. The flat one is the region where the fibers is, um, is um, slaved to turbulent fluctuation, while the, uh, the slope uh, is associated to the uh, elastic uh, response uh, to the natural uh, to oscillation with the natural frequency of the fiber. There is one more region which was not analyzed when uh, I discussed the single fiber. And this region corresponds to the overdamped uh, case. In that case, fibers are all the time are, um, are slave to turbulence. So a good option, if you want to use this kind of fibers to measure for properties, is to, to be uh, to fall, to select parameters in a way to fall uh, in this uh, overdamped over uh, region. Oh. Uh, um, what time is it? I probably have uh, Alessandra. Uh, I started with the timer. Uh, probably ten you minutes. Have, uh, let's say five, three, four more minutes, and then so there is time for questions if you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Alessandra. So I have to speed up. Uh, and uh, uh, what I want to say is that we analyzed also the possibility to use to use fibers to measure the transverse velocity. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. But now, uh, if you have, a, of course, if you have a, a rigid fiber, there is no way to measure the uh, uh, longitudinal fluctuation. Why? Because of the inextensibility condition. If you measure the velocity, the velocity at the two ends, and you project the velocity along the fiber, the difference is zero. Why? In general, the velocity of the flow will be not zero, of course. Hmm? Because remember, we want to measure the, fly, the flow properties net of this of the motion of the fiber this is a key point but nevertheless you can uh, you can imagine to use the rigid fiber to measure transverse transverse uh, fluctuations if you do that uh, if you do that uh, we analyze the problem both numerically and more importantly uh, let me skip this uh, slide because uh, the conclusion is uh, simple it works in the sense that this is the the, the, the probability density function, as you see, uh, for different uh, um, length uh, of the fiber, actually different stocks time. And as you see, 
there is a good agreement, reasonable agreement. There is problem of statistics also in this case, a reasonable agreement with the, uh, in the Eulerian measurements reported in, uh, in black, the continuous line, and uh, the, the, the red circles refers to a situation with a fiber, the inertia of which is so large that uh, you are not measuring at all the flow properties, but you are measuring properties of the fiber. So if uh, the message here is that provided the Stokes number is sufficiently small, you can measure uh, fluctuations, velocity fluctuations, uh, why of the flow of the turbulence, of, of turbulence, while if the Stokes number is uh, uh, high, there is no way you are measuring something else. But you are measuring the property of the fiber. Uh, we test uh, this also in terms of experiment. Uh, the experiment has been done uh, in the aquarium at uh, ETH, ETH in Zurich. And uh, unfortunately, I have no time now to give details on that. Let me only show uh, the final result. The final result is the uh, is reporting these two pictures. In the one, you can see that uh, there is a plateau. Uh, this is a tumbling time normalized by the turbulent at the uh, turnover time. There is a plateau, the value of which is around one. And this means that uh, your, flex, your uh, rigid fibers can be used to measure um, the temporal properties of uh, your, um, your turbulent field. Your turbulence is uh, um, in, the, in the aquarium, uh, they can uh, reconstruct uh, uh, with accuracy um, ideal, a uh, sort of ideal turbulence, uh, uh, homogeneous isotropic uh, and uh, uh, stationary turbulence. The picture on the right refers to the probability density function uh, of delta u transverse. There is no skewness because you know the skewness is present for the longitudinal uh, for longitudinal fluctuations, and the continuous line is the standard PTV reconstructed uh, curve. While symbols, triangles, triangles are refers to um, different simula diff simulations, sorry, <laughs> different experiments uh, with different uh, fibers having different length uh, as reported uh, on the on the right uh, top right of the of the slide. Uh, so uh, we also try to measure uh, observables where gradient are involved. For measuring gradient with a, uh, with a smart particle, you have to refer to the, the beautiful papers by, by Vot. Here we offer an alternative way to measure small scale uh, um, variation, that means uh, gradient essentially. Uh, and we measured in the experiment epsilon, which is a, a quantity we sometimes uh, is a source of problem in, the, in experiments because, because uh, you need to have many, many particles for the PTV inside the small volume, but you know there is uh, the, the Richardson law that uh, causes uh, this particle to uh, to increase their distance in time. And this means that if uh, in the initial time you have many, many particles in time inside this region, uh, after some time, uh, many, many particles uh, exited from the, from the volume and uh, you, don't, you don't have anything to, to perform, nothing to perform uh, uh, measurements. If you have fibers, this problem does not appear in the sense that uh, for a fiber, the end-to-end -end distance remains essentially the same. So this problem, this, uh, mm, this uh, techniques does not serve for the, pro the problem related to the uh, Richardson uh, diffusion. We measured epsilon in this way, the energy flux, and you see here in the picture the reasonable agreement, the good agreement you have between the PTV-based uh, measurement with the me measurements uh, based on the fiber. So uh, I don't have time to, to say just uh, one word, to say that uh, in terms of the fiber, you can also measure uh, the whole uh, tensor, gradient tensor. How to do that? We just tried numerically, no idea whether you can do that uh, uh, in terms of experiment, and uh, you test that uh, in two dimensions in simple flows. The idea is really very simple in the sense that if you have one fiber, you measure, for instance, the velocity difference, uh, um, the normal velocity difference. Imagine to have uh, three fibers, simply you can measure different uh, components of the uh, gradient tensor projected on the normal direction to this particular fiber. Now, the problem is now the following, because if you have a free fiber and they move independently, we are measuring one component there, the other there, the other there, so there is no, uh, it is really uh, useful. What you have to do is to link in some way the free fibers in a way that they measure the property uh, in, in, in the same point. What is the problem? The problem is that you if you clamp 
the two fiber, the free fibers, uh, there is a problem that uh, you are coupling the motion of the fiber. So imagine to have a fluctuation on one fiber, necessarily, if you are, they are clumped, the fluctuation transfers to the other fibers. And this means that we have a coupling which is not present necessarily in the flow field. So it doesn't work. We tried uh, to do the assembly simply in terms of the spring, which is easy to do numerically, but I don't know if it is uh, doable in experiment. Numerically, it works, however, which is at least an indication that we can try to understand how to do that uh, in, uh, in real life. And this is the reconstruction of the three components of the, of the, of the, of the gradient. As you see, they're almost indistinguishable with respect to what uh, you know uh, exactly because this is a chaotic flow and you know the, the gradient analytically. So let me move to the conclusion, uh, which are very, very uh, short, uh, in the sense that both in terms of fully resolved numerical simulation and this experiment, we were able to show the ability of fibers, both rigid and elastic, to measure for properties. And this uh, allows us to present an alternative way to measure two point statistics uh, in turbulence, and it was uh, uh, called uh, uh, fiber tracking uh, uh, velocimetry. Of course, there is uh, many things to do. And in particular, what we want to do is to analyze uh, the, 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 um, these techniques uh, for non-ideal turbulence, because uh, in, in that case, of course, the fiber can prefer to remain in some region and to avoid other, but I mean, this problem is also it's the same you have also when you are dealing with uh, particles. So uh, probably the same problem can be solved in the same way it is solved for uh, when you use particles for the classical uh, PTD. So thank you very much for the attention. Sorry if I'm a little bit, uh, uh, was a long, a little bit long. Thank you very much for the attention. Thanks, Andrea. Beautiful talk. I don't know if there's a quick question, we can have it. Or we move to the next speaker. So if not, okay, please, Klaus. Uh, thank you. Very short comment, maybe. Um, the overdamped limit of this problem without inertia in the fiber has been discussed a lot in in the context of semi-flexible polymers in the cytoskeleton of cells. And there um a multi-scale perturbation analysis has been done to take along the tension in the fiber with the other things and um, so variable tension in the fiber and, and there is a lot of work on this so that um, is not exactly your interest I, I understand but it's it's kind of very close and uh, it uncovered a, a lot of interesting scaling regimes uh, also without any turbulent fluctuations just if you pull on a fiber for instance transverse if you with a point force you get a very rich response non non monotonic non monotonic response and so on and you can discuss this using this multi scale analysis you can basically uh, solve all this analytically then the scaling scaling regimes and stuff yeah Interesting, but can, can you can you do the same also in the underdamped case, which uh, I guess is uh, already richer, uh, even richer than what you have. Yes, in yes. I, so the trick in the overdamped case is um, the the uh, you have the transverse and the longitudinal friction, and the modes that are basically balancing force wise are the very long modes. Uh, longitudinally because the longitudinal motion is is very small compared to the transverse motion if you have a transverse extension you get very little longitudinal uh, component only i mean if you if you push transverse then it you pull in the end but very little only if it's a weakly bending situation and so you you balance long modes in the longitudinal with short modes in the transverse direction and you can exploit this for the multi scale analysis and so that's a geometric um argument that should still work for you except um i'm not entirely sure about the inertia but but i suppose it it works similarly for the even for the underdamped case because inertia is then also distributed like the longitudinal friction along the whole chain so it, it would uh, in my uh, like like i'm just extrapolating but it, it should be the same argument same geometric trick that works thank you very much for the I can send you some, some thank you very much. Uh, thank you.